Well, hi, Power Rappers. This is Brian Knight from Pragmatic Works, and in today's session, we're going to focus all about accessibility. Well, and I have a special special guest here today with me. With me is uh, Kevin Erickson. Hey, Kevin, how are you today? Doing fine, Brian. How are you? Good, good. Well, tell us about yourself first of all. Like, what, where are you from, and what do you do? Sure, I'm on the East Coast. Um, I've been um, working in accessibility, digital accessibility, uh, specifically since about 2007. I've worked in the private and public sectors. Uh, accessibility is, you know, very important to me uh, for a number of reasons, and um, I think it helps all uh, aspects of, you know, programming or just development, the SDLC or the life cycle of a product. So I'm definitely um, staying in this area. It's one of my favorite things, and um, yeah, thank you for having me today. Cool. So what what do you mean when you say accessibility? What is accessibility? For an application right well as an accessibility lead um we um in, in this kind of framework we're looking at uh accessibility those with disabilities so that can be a whole subject right there but i'll just uh, at a very high level say that there are lots of obvious or visible ones such as somebody using a cane or um has uh, some type of an assistive technology that's very obvious and then there's a, a large percentage that can be invisible, such as cognitive or neurological. And then of course we have accessibility for those, um, not just with permanent, but also with temporary. So somebody may have had a eye surgery and so for a period of time, maybe two weeks, they're not gonna be able to use their vision. Maybe they have a concussion and there are specific things we uh, need to do as our um, body heals. Mm -hmm. So uh, even a, a person holding a child sometimes uh, creates that very temporary, but um, a valid uh, accessibility issue at that moment, somebody in bright sunlight in a noisy room for captioning. Um, so there's a lot of things. So that's what I mean by accessibility. Like I said, that's just the very, very tip of the iceberg. Gotcha. And why is it important that a company thinks about this when they're building applications? Um, some key things I'd like to just say right off the bat that we could go in deeper if we have time, but basically there's the civil rights of it. So we uh, need to make sure that all users are able to perform and then they're empowered to do the things that we need to do, such as a bank statement. It's very important there. Also, there's the liability aspect. So we have uh, businesses or companies that are getting a lawsuit. So we want to be protected in that way. So also, you know, there's a few other ones, but those are the two big ones. Gotcha. So, and then when should I start thinking about this when I'm building that application out originally? You know, um, so I get asked this quite a bit and uh, even when it's not asked, it's kind of obvious to tell when it hasn't been done um, at the very beginning. So there's the built-in and bolt-on, as we say. Uh, there's also a buzzword that's very uh, fitting called shift left. So when we look at the SDLC or the life cycle of a product, um, we want to put it in as early as possible. That's where we get the shift left. So that means that if you wait and do it later, there's a lot of rework potentially. There's wasted time and effort when it can be done up front. The process is much smoother. It's integrated in very deeply embedded instead of just kind of pieced on, if you will. Gotcha. Now we're going to show up quite a few demos in a second about how we can make power apps more accessible, but let's start with the top five things that you might be looking at as you're, as you're looking at accessibility. What, what might those be? So I like to, uh, today there's a very good number of these, but I thought uh, today we might be able to talk about alternative text, um, such as for images, um, mainly, it's a very common issue. We have implicit headings or giving it the hierarchical structure of the content that may be on a, on a page or screen. We're, um, how about keyboard um, friendly um, order of the tab index or the tabbing order so that when um, it's important that the flow through the content, um, such as actionable features, buttons, text fields, and so forth, do follow a top to bottom, left to right, so I'll stop there, or uh, too many spoiler alerts. Then we have color contrast, very common, whether it's in uh, digital content or even just driving down the road, I notice uh, constantly on the TV and whatnot. So we wanna make it 
um, important there. So let's go more into that one. Um, did we have any others that you wanted to discuss? Maybe forms with um, errors? Or we, we, yeah, that may be all, enough for now. You also, I know. Yeah, you yes, also mentioned a buttons with names as well. What do you mean by that? That's right. Yeah. Uh, so just a, on a top level, um, buttons do have to, they can be visibly one way, but for the assistive technology, such as a screen reader, they may not convey any information at all. And if you had a multitude of buttons that are super important for the functionality, then that user who cannot see the screen and is using a screen reader, for example, uh, may be at a loss and not able to complete their tasks or what they're gotcha. trying to do. So a lot of it comes down to just uh, adapting for screen readers to be able to see what your what your intention as an app builder is. And that's why you want to start early on, right, building this out. So I, what I thought we could do, Kevin, is I, I thought I can build the absolute worst application possible. It's actually remarkably easy for me. And uh, I thought we'd go ahead and go through this and kind of show some of the worst practices that I've done here and, uh, and kind of how we can get around those worst practices. So let me go ahead and start by opening up my terrible application here. And there we go. As you can see, it's a pretty terrible, pretty uh, awful one. And what we want to do here is I'll start with your, your button names, for example. Um, I noticed, like, for example, on this button right here, what, what is toggle right here? Does this kind of comply with your, your buttons have no names essentially here? Is that, would you consider that? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of things. So uh, when a button has a label, um, such as the toggle button or uh, any type of button, that uh, that subscribe toggle is a label for the button, the toggle button, and it needs to be programmatically associated. Uh, so if, uh, if I'm tabbing through the information, uh, my focus, and I'm not using a mouse, obviously, just had to say that, is that the visible focus will be very obvious with good color contrast. Um, and we can go more into the yeah. ratios and whatnot. No, but it needs to be, okay. So you actually bring up two things. There's actually the color contrast. So I can have like a false being like a red and then a, a green being the positive maybe, but also having the labels there, as you mentioned, to where I can mm -hmm. say, I can scroll down here in Power Apps after I select the little selector. And you'll see a lot of people don't set this, that the false text and true text, where I can say something like uh, false no, and then maybe the true text of yes, something like that. Mm -hmm. So at least now we can kind of, as I kind of toggle these, we can see exactly what's going on. So as you were kind of pointing out the, the color, I didn't think about the colors, that's actually a good idea. Mm -hmm. Now, what, now when I look at implicit headers that you're referring to, I have a header up here. What, what do you mean by, by that? Well, there's a, we call it headers and then we have headings. So we have uh, a heading level one, uh, two, three, four, and all through six. And those need to be sequential moving uh, from lowest to highest. So nested properly, you could have a, a heading level one, that's typically a title for the content. So uh, somebody who's not able to see the screen or just a, a table of contents of a book that I like to use as analogy is that we wanna know exactly what this content uh, pertains to is some purposeful, um, concise and short phrase that a heading would be. It's not a full-on sentence sort of, you know, 150 characters or less usually. Uh, so it could be short, three words, and we want it to be um, uh, the title. So then under it, it could have just multiple H2s in a row. But if there was something nested, you could put an H3 after one of those H2s and so forth. So you can go from a, a one to a two with some nested threes, and then you can go back to a two, or you can go all the way up uh, from to a six and drop back down to a two. But when you're going from one to two, you don't want to go to a four without a three because then you've broken the hierarchical structure. So it's um, it's nice when there's plenty of uh, information out there from W3C with the World right. Wide Web Consortium. So there's a lot of information there, but just speaking about it on a high level, that might be a good way to start. So and let me just add. Oh, please oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. One last thing is that when we have that proper outline structure and not just visibly of these dark um, or darker and bolded uh, phrases throughout the page, that uh, a screen reader user, for instance, can understand how the content is structured and uh, compartmentalized or outlined. And they can also use their keyboard, such as using H to go through all the headings, or I can hit my one uh, or my two, three on the, on the keyboard and go to those heading levels very quickly. So it's additional navigation.
So screen readers then can make sense of a header one versus a header two, and it kind of builds an outline. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Oh, cool. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this then. So in Power Apps, oh, let me get the right screen over here. There we go. And Power Apps, the way it handles it, if I look at this, this header up here, we'll come, we'll come back to colors in a moment here. But when I'm looking at this header, one of the properties here is the role property. And the role property is basically saying what role is this playing. The word default in Power Apps basically means it is just a text label. It's like any other label on the screen right now. So if I change this from text role dot default to text role dot, oh, there it is, heading one, then that will make, it doesn't actually change the look and feel of it, but it makes it where the screen reader is a little more, uh, handles that a little more appropriately now and builds that kind of hierarchy as Kevin's talking about as well. Uh, that, that's a great tip there, Kevin, I appreciate it. Now, you also mentioned the keyboard friendly nature of things. What, what would that look like on an app like this? If I play this and I start to tab around, I'm noticing that it is going in the right spot. The way Power Apps works, it works the Y axis and the X axis. Now I've kind of, normally what we'd see here is you'd see it start here and then jump over the, y, the X axis over here, then come over here. So I've kind of, I've grouped these together into a container to kind of force it to go down this path and then come over. But one thing you're noticing also as Kevin's alluding to is when I hit tab again at the bottom here, it never goes to my icon over here. So this is what Kevin means when he's referring to uh, the lack of, of uh, tab controls. Now, the way Power Apps handles this, when I select my icon here and I scroll down, you'll see one of the ways it handles this is this, uh, let me go over here, oh, there it is, tab index property. You may have seen this many times and curious what it means. Power Apps handles this with a negative one, meaning I don't care about this being involved in the keyboard controls, and then zero for yes, it is important, this is involved. So if I make this icon a zero here and I hit the play button, then as it kind of hit tabs down, you'll then see it. You can't quite see it. Let me, let me change one more thing here so you can see this. The next, next thing I'll change is I'll actually make it where the user can see that they have this selected also. So there is a property. Uh, okay, let's go find that one property here. Oh, border thickness, a focus border control here. And I'll change this to maybe a six. And oh, this is, the, this is when, it, when, it, when it's selected, how thick is the border going to be? And then I'll make it uh, I'll make it just red or something more obnoxious just so people can see that that it's been selected. So now as I flip through this, we should hopefully see. Oh, it's not behaving right now. But we should hopefully see it, it actually use that in the tab control also. Um, right now it is it, it does say negative one, does it? Oh, it say zero zero. Oh, tab tab index zero. Yep. So it is configured correctly, but for some reason it's just not behaving right now. Once I close it and open up again, it will likely start behaving. So Kevin, is that what you mean by when you refer to like the tab controls ultimately is just like hopping around there? Yeah, I definitely think that that's right on uh, the direction I would put it. You know, so we have uh, a sighted user, but they have a mobile impairment, not able to use the mouse. And so that visible focus that you were mentioning is so important to know where the focus is, uh, but also that order. So if it was jumping around, then it could be out of context and be confusing. Uh, it's also the expectation that it's moving. Um, a sighted user would be able to know where they're expecting to go, top to bottom, left to right. Uh, also with the, somebody who cannot see the screen, it's going to follow the order appropriately. Excellent, excellent, thank you. The other one that you mentioned, Kevin, was accessibility um, uh, alternative text pieces around that. What, why is that, what's, what's that mean in an app like this? Um, the, the response I like to give around that first and foremost is we have an image. Uh, so if it was something like an avatar or the user um, profile image, we could just have it as that. So a screen reader is typically going to let you know what the feature is. So if it is a button, it will say button. If it's a text field, it will say text field. So when we do the naming uh, and similar to an image, it's going to let us know what that is, such as an image. So all we have to do is say something like uh, company logo, or uh, okay. we would say, yep. Yeah. And so then it's going to add that. So just real quick, um, that's the obvious one. There's also two others that are really important is that when we have an image that's purely decorative and not supplying any meaningful information, we can give it a, um, 
alternative text of null if it's like html uh in your app it may be just giving it letting uh the users know that it's not blank but it is decorative uh, gotcha that actual word could be and one last thing if an image is repeating the context or text around it then that would be redundant we could actually just uh, give that image decorative and the screen reader would go to the content and they would get it right there perfect then so what if i were to look at uh, this application here, then, with my logo on it right here, uh, uh, Power Apps has this option here called Accessibility Label, which is basically what Kevin's referring to in the alt text. Uh, but if, if we put in some text here, like my logo, it will actually, the screen reader will actually read this off to the user as they kind of tab through this, this application. Likewise, these, these forms right here that have captions, all okay, it, uh, it will also read things like hint text right here for you. So if you have any kind of hint text in there, or kind of, kind of read-only kind of text, that, that uh, it will read that. And it will also read the accessibility label on this as well. So if you want to give your user instructions on how to use the app, it might be the hint text. If you want to give uh, vision-impaired people uh, some guidance on, on that one field also, like what this is at, than the accessibility labels. So you can use them in harmony there to make both of them work there as well. Now, uh, the other piece you mentioned here, which is a, a really critical one, um, is the for like vision impaired people or maybe colorblind people. This this label that I have up here is about the most uh, uh, terrible label I've ever built in my entire life here. Um, what uh, for a, for a header here? What why would this be bad? Yeah, so for uh, color vision deficiency, which is the technical and then uh, commonly called color blindness, uh, just keep in, um, in mind it's a range. So when you say color blindness, kind of means on or off, yes or no. And with color vision deficiency, there's a, quite a few. So you could have low vision, you can cataracts, um, you could have uh, just color blindness. So the color is not the only thing that conveys the information, such as green for approved or a line graph, for instance. So there's lots of examples. But here, when we talk about text, it gets a little bit into the details is that we have a 4 to 0 0.5 to 1 ratio, where 21 to 1 is the highest possible range or color contrast. So we have um, black and white, whether it's foreground or background, it's the same, 21 to 1. But the minimum for the standards of the guidelines, WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1, AA compliance, uh, the... Uh, 4.5 is the minimum for regular size text. Now, if it's bolded, which means a 700 weight or higher, or it's as a, a certain size or 18 um, uh, point higher or higher, then it is large text and it's three to one ratio. So what we want to do is just go a bit above that ratio. So I like about shoot for seven. Why not? Seven to one ratio, then you're clear and free of being right at the teetering of the edge of a violation. And so what it's gonna do is allow users to be able to just read it without uh, any type of strain versus, you know, um, when that can be a problem. So hopefully that so, explains that. So looking at this then, what would I need to do to change this? You mentioned I need to make, add more contrast to it, like that light versus light is, is really hurting me right now. So you'd recommend bolding it, it sounds like. So I, I do have a bold, thank goodness. But uh, just a color scheme, is there a, a, uh, that I need to fix here? Okay, hold still. I'll, I'll bring out my color contrast tool, which I actually just have handy. And so I could share a screenshot of this later if you wanted. But I have a this lightest blue, which is a BBC AE3 hex code and uh, an FFF um, text color. That's coming at 1.7 to 1. Ooh. So what we'd want to do is, yeah. so it's a bit below that 3 to 1 ratio that we need to meet. So I would need to darken that that background color to make it where it's a little more contrast like that. Is there a you mentioned a, a tool you're using right there? What type of tools tooling would you recommend that that users use to to determine if their contrast yeah. is adequate? There's there's some really good ones out there. They're all free. Um, I wouldn't pay for anything that I use. NVDA Screen Reader, uh, which is non visual desktop application or access. NVDA is a open source screen reader that actually works very well and doesn't sugarcoat for bad coding like some of the other, excuse me, paid versions do. And then when it comes to a free color contrast, there's one that's been around forever, Tana Guru, T-A-N-A, Tana, T-A-N-A, Guru, G-U-R-U. -U. 
Um, there's obviously some downloadable ones. So the ones that are in a browser, you don't even have to download anything. Uh, then there's the color contrast analyzer. Level Access has one that's um, that's downloadable and works very well. There's even some swatch builders that for accessibility where you can have multiple colors aligned. Uh, so it's important to have that color swatch kind of built in as a, a style guide, if you will, and the code libraries that you're using uh, to make sure they're accessible up front. So no matter what the developer or designers are using, they're pulling from something that's already been tried and true for accessibility. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Kevin. So then the other, the other little piece here to mention as well is Microsoft has built in a lot of these accessibility pieces for me as well. I found this one, one website called Accessibility Colors, and you pop your colors in here, and it'll tell you uh, if you had yeah. passed certain, yes. cer certain, cer certain types of certifications. Uh, Kevin mentioned a whole bunch of goodies as well, well there as well. Hope that's useful for you. The other thing to note is when you building your application, you'll see the stethoscope in the top right. And when you click on that in Power Apps, it will actually do an accessibility check for you. And I see that I have a number of errors I need to address. Mostly in my case, I'm missing the accessibility labels. And by changing that, mm -hmm. uh, it will then allow the screen readers to see those fields. Additionally, down below, you also want to make sure your screen names are more appropriate. Like right now, I have screen two and screen mm -hmm. three. By keeping it that way, the, the screen readers I use this morning will say screen, screen two open, screen three open, but it means nothing to the end user on what screen two and screen three is. So as you fix these, you can just hit the recheck button and it will go out there and actually make sure that, you're, that you have appropriate uh, metrics on that. Well, cool. Well, Kevin, hey, Brian, uh, can I add? Please. Well, since you had that screen up, I just wanted to add quickly is that generally we have severities of accessibility violations. They're not all the same. You can be 99% compliant and that 1% could be critical errors that are going to stop a user. Or they could be minor and then there's just an annoyance or there's an easy workaround. So it's important to understand that all accessibility violations are not equal. And when I see the way that those were uh, categorized, such as uh, errors and maybe warnings and tips, uh, I like to say, go ahead and fix them all if you can. Definitely start with the higher priorities, such as the errors and then the warnings, because sometimes uh, a warning could be more critical than it's leading on in this place, in, in that section that you showed us. Yeah. So I just wanted to point them out. Just go no, ahead and awesome. fix them all. What, uh, now, as far as you mentioned the regulations, what are the big regulations that are kind of uh, going over this that, are, that you, know, you might be in violation of and now you know you're in violation of? So what do you mean? Could you rephrase that? Oh, sorry. What, what regulations kind of, you know, kind of uh, oh. uh, guide all this? Oh, sure. So when I mentioned WCAG, so everybody might pronounce that acronym a little bit differently, but it's the, the principles of um, the, the guidelines from the W3C or World Wide Web Consortium. And so the Web Con Ex Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 is the current version. It has A, AA, and AAA, but AA is the compliance level that is accepted internationally. Okay, and so those are guidelines built on the four principles. Uh, just think of POUR, uh, P-O-U-R, uh, very easy to remember, and that's perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And each one of those covers a certain section, so then you have uh, the, all those guidelines down below it. Uh, so hopefully that gives a little bit about, yeah, absolutely. definitely look into that enough to go in and find all the information you want. I could even follow up with some links if we need them. That'd be great. And there's actually, we'll put those links in the description of this chat window, on the, on the description of this video also. There is a ton more here, as you can imagine. Kevin makes a living doing this. So making a living doing this is not something we can easily cover in 20 minutes, but we wanted to make sure we give you the, hot, the top five areas to look for at first in your Power Apps. Hey, Kevin, thank you for joining me. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up for the day? Well, hopefully this got enough curiosity or got some people going in a direction that would, um, you know, just go for that alignment in, in your company so that everybody's working on this together and not overriding each each thing. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that I have seen accessibility implemented in version 1.0 and then overwritten or erased a, a large majority of it in 1.1 because it wasn't in the requirements. So make sure that the, um, Definition of done, as we say in the hmm. in the algebra world, is that it, we're we're calling accessibility a part of done and putting it in. So business analysts, if they're creating something for developers and designers as a complete list to do, that accessibility is called out in there. Or Jira using some type of a um, 
what is the word, a tag or a label that will easily find all of those accessibility issues or uh, uh, levels that need to be tasked and completed user stories and whatnot, that the accessibility is clear and uh, easily understood. That's great, Kevin. Thanks for the advice. And thank you for joining thank Kevin you. and I today on this session on accessibility and power apps. Stay tuned for other videos like this on, the, on our channel. And thank you again. Have a great day.